Go ahead when you're ready, Jocelyn. All righty. I think we're getting most of our attendees in now. I see the number keep going up. Thanks very much. All right. Well, welcome everyone um, to this town hall on the Castaway School Redevelopment Plan. Hosted by the Palo Alto Weekly and Palo Alto Online, I am Palo Alto Weekly editor Jocelyn Dong. And I'm joined this evening by City Hall reporter, Janati Shainer. Um, we're really pleased to welcome to this forum, Nancy Kaufman, head of School of Castalea. Thanks for being here tonight, Nancy. Um, and then also we welcome Andy um, Reed. <laughs> Thanks, Nancy. We welcome Andy Reed, a neighbor of the school and a leader of the group, Preserve Neighborhood Quality of Life. Thanks for your time, Andy. Thank you. I'm just one of the, lead one of the leaders. A leader, okay. Gotcha. A leader. <laughs> um, also on this call, waiting in the wings, is Kathy Leyendecker, Associate Head of School for Castalea. She'll jump into the conversation if there are any details that are needed. And Bill Johnson, the publisher of the weekly, is also here. So don't be surprised if he pops up with a question from time to time. So to frame this town hall, this event is not a debate. We're seeking to have a conversation. Our goal is to create an environment that will bring clarity to the issues and the facts and not be as constrained as public hearings in front of city commissions and city councils. Um, so as such, we will not be following a formal format with time limits and such, uh, nor will we adhere to an equal time rule, but we will cover the main issues of this contentious project. So uh, enrollment, uh, transportation demand management, the subterranean parking facility, the gross floor area issue, special events, and trust and mistrust. So we'll also be taking your in questions, uh, which will be, you can put them into the question box. I believe it's Q&A below. We've already received a number of questions ahead of time, and we will be adding those questions into our conversation as it goes along. Um, so to set up uh, the background for the Castalea project, I'd like to ask Janati to give us an overview. Thank you, Jocelyn, and thank you to our panelists and um, everybody in the audience who's joining us for this Zoom town hall. Uh, I know there's been a little static in the background here and there. We appreciate you bearing with us. And uh, next year when we do them all in person, we'll all look back and laugh at it. But um, I just want to go over um, some of the things that are currently um, on the city council's agenda relating to the Castalea project. Um, I know many of you have pr probably tuned in to last Monday's public hearing, in which we've heard more than 70 people and groups of people talk about uh, really uh, broad issues, in some cases broad, some cases specific about Castalea, um, like the value of education and uh, things of that nature. But the things that the council will be actually voting on are much narrower, so just want to set the table here by mentioning three of them. Number one, the council will be deliberating on Monday, um, unless things change, on the environmental analysis uh, for the Castilea's proposed modernization project. Um, it's the, fi the final environmental impact report. Um, so they basically have to conclude that it meets uh, CEQA requirements and that the project has enough mitigations to offset any of its impacts um, to the neighborhood and the city. The second thing that they're gonna be discussing is um, a variance request. And for those of you who don't go to PTC meetings all the time, a variance request is basically like a, a zoning exemption that uh, property owners um, request whenever um, they feel like because of their irregular lot configurations of things of that nature, they can't enjoy property rights that other property owners could enjoy in a similar zoning district. Uh, so Castellet is, is seeking one variance for this project and the variance is basically what will allow them to replace um, their existing square footage with new buildings. Uh, without a variance, um, they, they have, they have a non-conforming um, uh, campus now, so which is okay because it predates zoning, but if they were to replace it, they would need a variance to make it happen. And the last thing, which is critically important to this whole debate is the conditional use permit. Uh, and that kind of gets into the heart of many of the things that people really care about, such as traffic impacts, enrollment numbers, things that we've heard both sides of the debate talk about a lot in the last few weeks. And I'm sure we will again um, on Monday. And so uh, before we go to our questions, I wanna ask both Nancy and Andy, if there's anything I just said that wasn't accurate, that wasn't clear that you'd like to clarify before we move on to the debate. 
I thought right. you did a great job. Thank you. Yeah, we're all set. Okay. So great I job. I understand that I am the cause of the static that you are hearing. Um, I will do my best to speak right into my microphone. Um, if the uh, fellow panelists can just tell me if I need to speak louder, just, just let me know. I do apologize. So as we launch into this conversation, uh, we want to just start by giving both Nancy and Andy a chance to talk about one or two of the most important things to them. So starting with Nancy, mm. uh, what are one or two most important things about your project do you think the public misunderstands or is confused about right now? Oh, I'm, there's a, several layers to that question because the things that um, are most important to me might not necessarily be the things that uh, people have you know, significant questions about. I mean, what's most important to me, I've, I've spent my whole career, this, this project uh, is like a, a vision for the future that really matters to me in terms of positioning Castilea School and the next generation of young women and the next generation and the next generation long after we're all gone. Uh, I mean, ultimately, I've put all this energy into this project because of that, of that priority and of that thing that is like close to my heart, right? I, what I think people misunderstand about the project is that uh, the campus is not, it's not an expansion. We have, um, we're asking to maintain our square footage that we have. We've actually pulled the campus back from the streets. The roof lines are lower. The circle in the middle is smaller. Uh, so in, in that regard, expansion has always been a little bit of a challenging word. We are looking to increase enrollment. And I guess the last thing I'll say that is, is, is important is that we have designed and requested a CUP that requires us to prove that we won't add more trips so that we gradually increase students as we prove um, that we have not increased car trips. And that's after we've reduced it already by 31%. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you both of those points. Um, and Andy, uh, what are one of two of the most important things that if the project were to change in these ways, one or two ways, what would, what would those be to best address the concerns of neighbors like yourself? Are there a couple changes you can point to? Yes, I think um, I appreciate Nancy's um, strengths in providing such a great education for girls at Castilea. Um, of course, where we're coming from, this is not about girls' education at all. It's about code enforcement and abiding by the rules and the agreements that you make when you run a school, a private school, on a small six acre lot in a res very tightly packed um, residential area between two arterials, our Embarcadero and Alma and the, and the trains. Um, so we would like to see what Nancy said about the enrollment starting with this big number, it's a 30% increase. And that isn't just 30% more girls, it's girls and parents and families and volunteers and a very intense all, uh, addition to an already intense school, rather than grant that at the top, we rather would prefer that in, instead have the school rebuild, modernize, bring in a beautiful building, and then have a modest increase and work your way up by proving that you can in fact decrease traffic from even no net new trips is almost 1200 car trips a day, which is huge in this tiny area. And so we would just like to turn that around and start it with a lower number and do most of what the school wants to do. You won't need an underground garage. There's plenty of parking already on campus. And 
start from that way and then earn your way up to a higher enrollment. Once you've proven you can, with an authentic shuttle program mandated by the city, bring traffic down. Okay, so um, hearing your points, enrollment, um, no underground garage. We're going to get to both of those topics tonight, <laughs> for sure. So I'm going to turn it back to Janati for the next couple questions. Yeah, and I want to um, follow up with Andy. One, one thing that became clear last Monday's meeting is that um, this is really is a divisive project and no neighbor could really claim to speak for the entire neighborhood. I think I, I counted like more than 50 names pro and more than 50 names against when you count those who came into groups. And, and I, I can see how that could create a challenge um, for, for Castilea as it tries to kind of engage everybody and potentially kind of help get to a solution that all neighbors could potentially embrace. So I guess my question is, how do you think the city council should attempt to determine the best outcome for the neighbors, given that residents don't speak with one voice? Yeah, I think it's a, that's a really good point, um, Janai, because I was, of course, listening to every speaker. And um, there were many supporters of the school who um, described themselves as neighbors, and perhaps certainly in the global sense, um, but perhaps not in the sense that the rest of us are who live just within the few blocks surrounding the school. Um, and they often didn't say they were parents when in fact they are. So there's an affiliation situation going too with the speakers. Um, I have no problem with anybody speaking, of course it's public, um, but I think you should describe your affiliation with the school when you speak. Um, but we've been around for a really long time. Uh, when the plans were first dropped, uh, we first heard about them when they were already submitted to the city of Palo Alto, fully baked. So we were shocked at the enrollment increase of 30%, uh, the underground garage, um, and tearing down five small buildings to build one big one. So I know you're gonna get to these topics, but that was really a, a solidifying moment for all. We were just scurrying around to each other's houses and saying, what is going on here? And we have spent almost five years speaking with officials. Um, we also, um, the school is required to uh, meet with neighbors twice a year. So we go in and so we all know each other. We all know each other. So um, I think we've made ourselves very familiar um, you can't speak for everybody, um, but we have a very solid group of surrounding neighbors that we can call on. And Nancy, a question for you about this topic. Um, I mean, there's been a lot of conversations about uh, Castilea's role as an education institution and that I don't think anybody denies the excellent work it, it's been doing, but. Uh, it also has another role as a property owner in an R1 neighborhood. And I think that's where a lot of the debate is centered around. Um, other than the benefit that you mentioned earlier, the broad value of um, providing education to young women, what benefits do you believe the, uh, the project holds specifically for the Palo Alto community and the surrounding neighborhood? And why haven't there been any kind of offers of like public benefits for for the uh, Palo Alto residents, um, you know, it's a similar conversation that we have whenever Stanford goes to a big project. Okay, so lots of really great questions and I wanna to try to tackle as many of them as possible. And first I do wanna say as a neighbor who lives one block from the school, many of the neighbors who, who spoke um, are really nearby neighbors, some who live directly across the street from the school. And I just wanna say, I know that it's, it, it seems uh, relevant to excuse the value of the school as a school. But if you think about someone who lives directly across the street from the school, and I'll just give you an example of um, uh, Jerry Marshall. She lives directly across the street from the main entrance to the school. She has no affiliation with the school and she's 100% supportive of the project. Now, she's not supportive of it because she's looking forward to construction. Uh, she's, she's supportive of it because she's determined for herself and the value of education in our community that the inconvenience 
uh, that, that the value of the school outweighs the inconvenience. And I do believe there are a number of neighbors who feel that way, who feel that schools, museums, libraries, churches, they add to the fabric of the neighborhood in and of themselves. And there are many people who actually enjoy seeing the students come and go. I won't even, I mean, there's a whole other area around engagement in the community and the kind of work that students do in the community. But the last thing I want to address, Janati, that you brought up, because this is actually um, an issue of concern for us. We're not allowed to open our campus to the public. We're not allowed to offer any public benefit because it would inconvenience the neighbors. So that is built into our CUP and we have not asked to have that changed because it, it, it's just not even imaginable to us that that would be permitted. But as, as, a, as a property in the neighborhood, we would welcome that opportunity if it were allowed in the CUP. And I think many people don't realize that. It's often, you know, we're accused of not opening the campus to the community. We're not allowed to have any events on campus that don't directly benefit the institution or, or educational mission. I take your point. I, I will just say that um, public benefits could be many, many things that are apart from holding big events that would convenience neighbors. And I think, as I said, we see that often um, when discussing Stanford. But I do want to kick it back to Jocelyn to talk about enrollment, which is one of the one of the big items in this proposal. All right, thank you, Janati. Um, so let me just frame the issue of enrollment for everyone who's listening. Um, the issue of student enrollment is critical to this approval process. Uh, for Castilea, enrolling more students furthers its mission of education. For neighbors, the school's history of exceeding its enrollment cap has greatly contributed to some of the mistrust we're seeing today. The proposed uh, CUP, uh, which the Planning Commission approved for to do, supports gradually increasing enrollment to 540 students, provided that the traffic conditions don't worsen and that any increase in any given year does not exceed 25 students. Two commissioners, however, supported limiting the increase to 450, which they noted would give Castilea a chance to regain the community's trust before seeking further expansion. Uh, given that background, here are our questions. Um, so for Nancy, so you seek an in increase in enrollment to 540 from your current authorized amount of 415 and your current level of about 426. Could you please explain to us the genesis of this enrollment increase and why 540 is the number. Sure. And I apologize because it is a little bit of a, of, a, of a long story for me to get it right. Um, I became the head of Castilea in 2010 and um, became aware of this situation. I have to admit, I didn't even know what a CUP was when I became a head of school. I didn't know what our enrollment was. Um, when I, uh, I went with the board chair and um, another board member and two attorneys. And we met with Curtis Williams, who was planning commissioner at the time. And we said, we're over enrolled. We are at, uh, I think it was 448 at the time. And uh, you know, what do we do? And he said, you're going to have to apply for a new CUP. Uh, at that time, he said, we're not gonna do anything because we haven't had any complaints. That changed later, which is fine. We never uh, questioned uh, paying a fine, but at his direction to us was you need to tell your neighbors and it is my recommendation that you put together a 10 year plan for your campus before you talk to your neighbors about this. And so we did uh, actually do a plan for the campus. It's quite different than the one we have now because of uh, quite a bit of input that we've had over the years, but we presented that initial plan and, and the enrollment number to the neighbors. Later on, uh, when Jim Keene as city manager uh, gave us a, um, a plan for reducing and we were doing that plan. And then he actually, because we had reduced traffic by so much, 
and, and parking. He allowed, and, and we had applied for a new CUP. We were trying to apply for a new CUP. I mean, it was a very long process because of, you know, and I'm sorry that Andy um, wasn't aware of the meetings that were happening um, at, at Bruce and Carla's home, you know, for, for two years, but um, that there was a plan being worked on. And so we were allowed to freeze enrollment. And then neighbors said, no, wait a minute, this has gone on too long. And Jim said, you're right, it's gone on too long. Let's go back to the reducing by four. So then your other question, which is why 540? So um, I believe that before Castilea thinks uh, beyond this current campus, we, we should, um, create the best possible learning environment we can on the campus that we have. It's very clear to us that we need to increase the size of our high school. The demand is extraordinary. And so we worked with our traffic consultants to come up with a number that we could manage on our campus. Obviously fire marshals and all kinds of people like that have something to say about how many students you can have on a campus, but really how many students could we enroll and increase our shuttle program and our offsite parking program to guarantee no new trips? And that was the threshold number that our traffic consultants came up with. Meanwhile, it is an ideal number for us because it allows us to increase the high school really with limited increase in staffing. So that's, that, that was another, um, so we get to improve our programs, our athletic program, our theater arts program, language program, many programs improve because we have a, a, a few more students to work with and um, we don't really have to add um, many staff members. Um, not to put too fine a point on that, but is, is the ability to increase um, athletic programs and other offerings is that in part provided for by increased finances from more students and more tuition? No, no, I'm so glad you asked that, Jocelyn. It's because we're not a big enough school to have a junior varsity. We only have a varsity. We're not a big enough, so we have 60 students per grade. And so what we're looking to do is to add 25 to that number, right? And then that allows us to have um, a theater program where we actually can have an orchestra. It's those kinds of things. It allows us to um, potentially um, have more than four girls in our advanced Mandarin classes. So it's things like that. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. um, when people talk about 540, they sometimes wonder if that is the ultimate cap on enrollment for Castilea at Bryant Street? Or if, if, for example, you were to not uh, increase traffic, if the school would be eyeing a higher number in the future, 600, 700 students, do you have a feeling on that? I, I don't have a feeling about that. I think that the campus that we're designing is really designed for this number of students. And um, I mean, that, we, you know, we, we value so much being in Palo Alto. Uh, we're proud of, of our location. We believe that, um, you know, some of the sacrifices that girls make to go to an all girls school uh, are offset by being in such a vibrant community near town and country. And, and uh, so, so we do love our location. Uh, we're, at least I will say under my watch, and I hope to be around to cut the ribbons on these new buildings, um, the desire is really to make the very best use of the current campus that we have with that, with that number of 540. And a lot of research has, has gone into that. And I could, go, I could even give you more detail about the staffing, but you're probably not that interested. <laughs> I think we will move on to another question, but um, good to know. Um, Andy, the Planning Commission added the no net new trips um, requirement last fall. Um, so that means that students can be added and no traffic will um, be generated above what is currently uh, the conditions. So given that, uh, that the traffic needs to be handled, 
why is it that you would oppose the student population increase to 540 right off right off the bat with the scaled increase? Yeah, um, thank you, Jocelyn. Again, I, I've touched on it earlier slightly, and that is that once, um, if in fact the school was allowed to jump 30% in enrollment to 540, they would legally be allowed to enroll 540 students in the school. And even if their CUP says, you know, 25 students a year, and if it doesn't work out, then we'll step back, we'll phase in, we'll step back. It's a very complicated process. It would require, it has to be proven over some months and then a hearing in front of planning and transportation. And then it's not like the school is giving up their due process rights um, by, um, just saying, oh sure, we had a problem, so we won't add 25 students this year. It's a very complicated process. If I had an ounce of proof for every 10 pounds of paper work that identifies all the mitigations and the TDMs and the planning and the process and how it's all gonna work out on paper, there will be no new net new trips. It's a very complicated process. And I know we're gonna get more into the EIR, um, but and to put all the risk on us that this is gonna work out is, is unfair. Um, and I'm stepping back just a moment um, in that I, I was, we owned our house, we rented it out to others and lived in San Francisco. But in 2013, yeah, my husband would go to these meetings um, at Carla and Bruce's. As I remember in 2013, the, pedagogical optimum was 450. And so that was sort of what, you know, you had been at and then the school was going to reduce back to 415. And um, unless they got a new cup that allowed 450. So that's all, sort of all where we were. So it was, you know, it was really surprising to see 540. So um, it's, it's an issue, you know, we would be willing to work up to 450 after they've rebuilt their school, give them that, which is about an 8% increase, which is what they got, you know, the last cut, and then show that this can uh, work for them and see the improvement in traffic and have it come down with a real shuttling program. 75% of the kids at Casalea come from out of town, um, so they can't ride their bike and walk. And, um, but neither do they have to drive. And an underground garage, you know, invites more traffic into the group. So um, that is why uh, this 1198 is supposedly the EIR car trips currently. And that's a huge amount of car trips a day. Although I noticed in the staff report, they've got 1298 or something that the school can step back to, no? Um, it's, you know, it's a number. So uh, let's see how it goes, you know, and work our way up. Okay, and Nancy, I just want to get your response to that. The idea of starting with a 450 cap and then applying in some way to, for the increases afterwards, what, um, what would be your opposition to doing it that way as opposed to the way that's proposed currently? Uh so, so one thing I just want to clarify when that pe many people probably don't know that whenever you count school trips, every car is counted twice. So I just, I do want to make sure people are aware of that um, because it's assumed the car is coming and going. And also um, nearly a hundred percent of our students who live um, further from the school now come on the train. So um, that's how we've managed really to reduce um, our traffic and parking by so much. And now um, to your question of, of the 450, I mean, what we have built into this plan actually requires us to uh, roll back enrollment and, and pay fines. So, I mean, I, I can appreciate um, that there's um, a concern about 
you know, some of the, whether we'll be held accountable. I don't think Castilea School, uh, I mean, we've worked so hard to regain the trust of our community. And it's one of the reasons why some neighbors now support us who didn't support us. And, uh, you know, that, that uh, we, we think we've fought hard to earn the right to continue uh, on the path that we're on. And whenever um, we talk about the parking, which, you know, we have to park our project one way or the other. We either have to have um, surface parking or below grade parking. Either, I mean, it's a parking lot. It's either put underground or it's on the surface. There's nothing about the fact of having a parking garage that automatically means more cars, more traffic, we're capped at how many trips we can have. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just getting back real quick to the idea of starting with 450. And I think the planning commission said that would be a way to sort of feel the misgivings um, mm -hmm. towards the school. Um, is it a oh. timing issue? Is it a matter of having to delay admissions for students? If, for example, you um, had a monitoring, had three monitoring reports, one of which um, is from this current academic year. And if that, if those three monitoring reports are A-OK, -okay, then you get permission to well, add. In a way, Jocelyn, in a way that is how it's written. It, it just sets a cap. At, at how many times we can do that. I mean, that is basically how it's written, that each time we would get, we would add 25, we would have to prove, have all the proof points, penalties, reductions, um, a pullback. So this seems like um, a cleaner way, you know, to get, to get to the vision. I also do wanna say um, something about the 450 being pedagogically sound. Um, back in 2012, when I reported to the neighbors that we were over-enrolled, um, I was asked, how did this happen? And I explained that the previous head had determined that there was a good pedagogical reason for adding four students per grade. So going from 60 to 64. And that was how the over-enrollment came about. Okay, thanks very much. I'm gonna hand it over to Janabi now. Thank you, Jocelyn. And um, we're gonna st stick with traffic for a while because I wanna get into a little more specifics and also because it's so central to both uh, the conditional use permit discussion and the EAR. But um, so um, as, as you just heard, the environmental analysis and the proposed conditions um, sort of um, require that uh, Castilea control the number of uh, trip, uh, con uh, mit mitigate its trips, uh, else it can't expand its enrollment. Um, we just alluded to the planning commission discussion of this very topic. And um, the environmental impact report identified a bunch of strategies for keeping traffic impacts at a less than significant level. Uh, these include additional shuttle bus routes, carpool programs, offsite drop-off, provision of um, transit passes, bicycle repair opportunities, things like that. The planning commission voted uh, to go a step further and institute a no net new trips um, requirement, which we just heard about. And uh, Castellet's TDM experts sub um, subsequently submitted a letter saying they believe that this requirement would, and I quote, exceed what is necessary. Um, so my question uh, for, for Nancy and Castellet is, um, do you now accept a no net new trips as part of the proposal or do you still um, think it exceeds what's required and do you oppose it? So Gianni, I may have to ask Kathy about this because my understanding is what we were saying was um, an unfair expectation was real time counting that we would be expected to pay for something that is beyond even what Stanford has. There was, there was a misconception during the PTC meeting that Stanford was, uh, did already have this kind of real-time counting um, and that we were being asked to do that when in fact um, that felt to us excessive. But maybe Kathy, if you wouldn't mind just um, clarifying that, I would really appreciate it. And I, you know, Kathy's in the wings 
uh, to help me with this. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me this evening. Um, yes, Nancy, I think that was uh, uh, one of our uh, more significant concerns. Um, I think that the other point that perhaps is, perhaps the uh, transportation engineer was trying to make is that the numbers that ha had been uh, recommended by staff do not uh, pose a significant impact. So there was a modest increase, but it was not determined to be a significant impact um, according to the EIR consultant. So I, I believe that that might be the nuance that was included in that letter. So does that mean this Castilea oppose going from less than significant impact to nominally at least no impact at all, which would, which is how we think of as no net new trips, locking in 398 AM trips or whatever the level is. Um, is there still a opposition to the, the policy that PTC approved? Would you want to see it revert to what was in the EAR? I mean, I think it's I think it's hard for us to um, answer in isolation. You know, like there are a lot of different. As, as Andy said, there are a lot of different you know pieces to this proposal. So I I think uh, it sort of depends. Yeah, I I think that one of the things that will happen, Janati, as you know. Um, is we'll be in, um, there'll be a moment in time when council will be looking at all the different conditions and asking us, um, what if this or what if that? If you got this enrollment, would you give up that? If you got, so I think that's probably why Kathy's a little hesitant to say um, off the bat, um, you know, what it's, it's going to be incumbent upon council really to decide which of the factors. Um, are most important to them. And uh, look, we want to build a new campus and we want to educate more girls. And what we've learned is that our community, you know, each year we enroll a new group of students and families who completely buy in to how we do transportation. So whereas, um, you know, 10 years ago, you would never see a sixth grader taking the train to Castilea. Now we have three vans that have to go pick up, sometimes more, because every student now who lives along the train. So it's, it's not getting harder for us to do. It's actually getting easier. We're encouraging teachers when they relocate to the area to make sure they uh, rent an apartment that's you know, along the train so they can take the train and we can pick them up at the train. So um, you know, we have a vision of just getting better and better at this. And this is probably a great moment for me to say that uh, less, so less than 50% of our students arrive in a single occupancy vehicle. And our employees may only arrive at work in a single occupancy vehicle two days a week. I would love to see every employer in Palo Alto do that. That is one of the um, greatest ways that we have um, you know, made our first big dent in traffic and trips and parking. Okay, I'll just know that at this moment, uh, Castellet is on the record through its attorney's letter after the PTC meeting as opposing no net new trips. I haven't heard anything that suggests you have gone from that position other than saying, we'll look at the totality of the situation. So I'll mm -hmm. assume that's still the default position and you can correct me if that's not the case. But I wanna uh, pivot to Andy and ask her about the very same policy no net new trips. Um, I was curious what it, you and your group thought of the PTC's decision, whether you think this is a important measure, whether you'd like to see it go forward and whether this policy would alleviate some of your concerns about the expansion. Um, again, uh, the EIR is a state, it's a CEQA act. So um, it comes in with the baseline. So the baseline at that time was this 1197 car trips per day. And yes, that's in and out. It's a lot of activity. And we feel that our problem has always been that traffic is a real issue. So I, we're not happy with talking about uh, 1198 as a baseline. If that was for CEQA, we're talking about the cut. We feel if you want to increase your enrollment, then seriously embrace 
you know, a shuttle program where out of town kids meet at Kiss and Rides. They meet their parents, drive them, they get on shuttles and they start their day that way and come in. It's not unheard of at all. There's other schools on the peninsula that, that do it. Um, there's a school, there's many schools that require shuttling in. I do wanna bring up one uh, point that we've been talking about and I have a different perspective on the 450 that we talked about from 2013, because really the schools, you know, maximum enrollment was 415. So when the city did require that the school reduce enrollment over some years time, this, this I've read a lot of the uh, public record and, this, and the school in fact did so for a couple of years and then they just stopped. They stopped for a couple of years and I think the city may have acquiesced, but it was the school who proactively said, hey, we're gonna reduce our, T we're gonna really have a strong, robust TDM here. So we're, we're not gonna reduce our enrollment anymore. And they just didn't. And so we, PNQL, that is our neighborhood group, had to hire an attorney and have James Keene write a letter to the school to require them to begin reducing again. It's an interesting position that the school is in asking for a 30% enrollment increase when they don't take seriously that they've made an agreement and they're not at 415 now. It's an, an interesting perspective. So this might be a really good time for them during construction to find other ways to bring students in for traffic issues and to get their enrollment settled out. I understand this 64 students per class would be much better than 60 per class, but that's trumping city code. That's, that's not acceptable behavior when you're operating under a use permit. So um, again, we have the same sort of you know, we talked about trust. It's not, it's not really trust. These are business dealings. You know, this is a school. It's a fine institution, but you make an agreement and you stick with it. And this idea that um, even if it were a no net new trips thing, um, I think we need to go down from that. Uh, what we need to do is not use a baseline of where they were when we were having lots of traffic issues. Um, but say work your way down and once you have, then we'll be talking enrollment. The underground garage is all, you know, it's a balancing act enrollment in underground garage, but even it, it, it the amount of re parking required on campus for this high enrollment number of 540 is 104 spaces per code for a private school and they have 86. So they're adding 20 new spaces with an underground garage. Well, that is hugely- we'll get to the garage in just a moment. Okay. I just okay. want to stop it for a second because garage is a huge issue and they're obviously related. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's hard not to. Unless it's a basement, in which case they're slightly less related, but the facility <laughs> is still related to traffic. But I want to yeah. stick with what you said at the beginning, because I think you did make a point about having this kiss and ride program, the mandatory shuttles where people could be shuttled in from, from elsewhere in the city and mitigate as a mitigation. I want to ask Nancy, why not pursue that kind of kiss and ride idea that the neighbors proposed? We have a number of shuttles that uh, pick up students in their, in their neighborhoods and come, come to Castellana, which is why on Monday night, you heard people who live directly across the street from the school uh, say that they don't feel that there is traffic anymore, that it's not as much of a concern for them as it once was. And in fact, uh, there was a meeting that we had um, you know, we, we've had several meetings with neighbors, you know, even in the, in the city's office where um, the, it was, well, we don't have a traffic problem anymore. Now we have a parking problem. We don't have a parking problem anymore. We have a traffic problem. I think there's, um, 
you know, there's some emotion involved in this and I understand that, but uh, the, the, it's very clear, we know from the neighbors who live directly across the street from the school that the traffic has been reduced by 31% because we do have shuttles, we do have students taking the shuttles, they take the train um, and so forth. But I think the idea here is having the kind of larger offsite lots and having like bigger shuttles that bring in most of the students. Yeah. You guys have that kind, of, that kind of shuttle program or is it more kind of smaller? So we do have offsite parking as well uh, for employees. And we, one of the things that will happen is if we increase enrollment, we will have to add even more shuttle programs as, you, as you're describing. Because remember what we're saying is that we're gonna increase enrollment and have and not add the trips. And so that will mean we'll have even more um, rigorous transportation demand management. Great, so I'll kick it over to Jocelyn now for the next segment. Um, it's a garage or is it? <laughs> All right, sorry, before we get there, um, I've just switched headphones, so I don't know if I'm still staticky. No. Perfect. Right. Not staticky. Yeah. No. We are in Silicon Valley after all. Um, okay, so I just wanted to insert one question from readers um, having to do with transportation. Um, this one comes from someone who I guess is a nearby resident, says, I see many Castilea girls parking their cars in the surrounding neighborhood. Uh, they park right in front of houses that have gone out of their way to make discreet signs asking them not to park there. I've seen residents come out of their houses and politely ask them to park on campus or repark. And this person says that they never have seen them actually move. The question is, does the school take action uh, against a student when a student violates the no parking in the community agreement? Yes, there are consequences. And um, I wouldn't doubt that that has happened at some time in the past. That is not a regular occurrence any longer. We have our employees no longer driving and parking off site. And so students are able to park around the perimeter of the school. Is there a way that uh, the school knows or monitors uh, kids in the neighborhood as opposed to kids parking on campus? Absolutely. We do monitor cars with stickers that are, and every car has to have a sticker and that, that is any student who's registered at the school and drives to school. And we do monitor those. In fact, uh, much to their chagrin, we go into their classroom and pull them out of their classroom and we make them move their car. Okay, thank you for that. All right, so um, speaking and about- And consequences after that too. What are those consequences? <laughs> that, that, that's that's um, you know, underneath the, the code of discipline at Castilea School. Got it, okay. So um, speaking of parking, uh, among the most contentious elements of the modernization plan is the proposed garage. Um, when it was proposed in 2016, uh, Castilea said it was doing so in response to neighborhood concerns and maintained it would improve the school's landscaping and reduce neighborhood impacts. So many neighbors have challenged that views and have opposed the garage in the meantime. Um, they've called instead for shuttling and other TDM programs. So adding to the complexity and the confusion is this city zoning issue. <laughs> so the fact that the zoning code forbids underground garages in R1s zones, although the prohibition seems to be applicable only to residential uses, but many residents and some planning commissioners have challenged the staff's decision to classify the garage as a basement, which allows the structure to remain in the plans without counting towards floor area calculations. So the key issue here um, is uh, that the city needs to make necessary findings um, to approve this garage um, and uh, in the conditional use permit and the variance, um, it has to accept the staff's interpretation of all these different zoning um, minutia. <laughs> um, so the question starting off is uh, for Nancy, can you clarify the origins of this parking facility and which neighbors exactly requested it? Mm -hmm. I absolutely can. I was there and I can tell you about the day, the same meeting in which I stood in front of neighbors and told them that we were over enrolled and that we had plans to redevelop the campus. It was, um, you know, it was probably one of the most difficult um, 
evenings for an early head of school to have, um, you know, neighbors were, were adamant that they, not only did they want a garage, but they were very angry that they had been promised one and never gotten it. And uh, over and over again, we were promised a garage and we never got it. And um, it, I did a tremendous amount of work to convince the board of trustees that it was going to be a non-starter with the neighbors, that we were going to have to figure out how to do this underground garage or we would not be able to make progress. And um, there's even a, um, an article in, I think it was in the Mercury News, one of the neighbors was quoted when I, we, we actually sent out an announcement to the neighbors that we were finally going to do the garage. And we were, there was a quote in the paper, one of the neighbors saying, finally, Nancy Kaufman gets it. And uh, I mean, the, the, the effort on that, the, the desire for that was so strong. And then really from 2013 to 2016, there was a group of neighbors who worked with, we had a facilitator uh, named Jeff Ball and Jeff took minutes at every one of those meetings, those, those minutes are part of our application. Uh, and at the end in 2016, when we finally had a plan that included a garage, which at that time had all pick up and drop off underground in the garage, which had later changed. Um, the, the, the neighbors that had been, as far as we understood, appointed by the rest of the neighborhood to represent the neighbors, we're very happy with that plan. All right, um, and Andy, um, can you please explain the opposition to the garage um, from your standpoint, from your group standpoint? Is it an environmental sustainability issue? Is it a traffic circulation issue? Is it just that there are going to be more cars in fact when there's a garage? Yes, it definitely invites traffic. And um, Jocelyn, you hit it on the head in terms of um, the idea of uh, digging this hole and filling it with polluting cement and um, building a bunker for storage of cars is not something that jives with Palo Alto's sustainability goals. Um, and I'm familiar with the folks that met um, for the some couple of years prior to the 2016 submittal. Um, we all hang out together. We're, um, they're Kellogg people and we're Melville Emerson people, but we're all in the same group of trying to reduce the scope of this thing. And they, I'm sure that underground garages were a part of the discussion as we're shuttling, shuttling and offsite parking space uh, lots were the most attractive choices. The result of these meetings weren't that, oh, here's the input, here's how we're gonna build our plan. Let's take it to the wider group or let's take it to the neighbors. They were as surprised as we were once the plans were provided to the city of Palo Alto, boom. And they included tearing down the Lockie house and, and some housing stock next door uh, with the exit uh, for the garage aiming directly at my neighbor's front door. So um, one of the good things that came out of the EIR was of the um, significant uh, and unavoidable, unavoidable impacts were all basically around this exit and having all of the traffic flow through the garage allowed the houses to remain so the, we are very pleased that the plans are now retaining those houses. The garage was reduced, but it doesn't ameliorate the issue with bringing the traffic in and having the exit come out onto a very narrow Emerson Street and then try to get on Embarcadero at that point. That's a very dangerous corner. We've got cars coming, zooming from town and country under Alma and up and then a, a curve at that corner as well. So not only now do we have an entrance on Bryant Bike Boulevard, which is a super busy pedestrian bike um, and uh, traffic cars as well, 
on Bryant and Embarcadero, but that's also the entrance to the underground garage. And then it exits on this tiny little street that if it's parked up, you cannot see from how to get into that Emerson, much less to get onto Embarcadero. Those are still there, but they've also added the, uh, as we have now, two loop driveways, as well as there's an additional parking lot with an in and out, and then the delivery um, access road as well. So we have a lot of things going on. And um, to avoid the, uh, we're not onto the EIR yet, but um, it's related to the garage in that now, um, there, they instead of requiring the 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 reason that they the EIR preparers determined that we have they have reduced these impacts from significant and unavoidable to acceptable is that they are dispersing traffic, not um, reducing it, but dispersing it. So we don't have a lot of confidence in that. And so it's not, also, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to clarify. So it's not the numbers per se um, that you're concerned about entirely, but it's also the, the, the conditions of Bryant being a bike boulevard, for example, the traffic coming up in Barcadero at Emerson. So there, so in your mind, there's some dangerous conditions that don't strictly relate to numbers of cars. Um. I think, I think it does relate to the numbers of cars. Okay. If we didn't, um, again, the increase in parking spaces from what is there now, which is 86 spaces to what will be there if the proposal were to be approved is 104. It's only 22 more spaces, but we've added a lot of driving around the area from coming into an underground garage. The underground garage has a lot of other issues as well. It is impairing trees that they school is um, presenting as though they are saving, but there's some serious impairment going on. So we've got a stand of six redwoods that the two outer ones are going to be impaired. And then there's this beautiful um, oak tree, tree number 89, which will have its roots bisected by equipment for the underground pool, as well as um, the driveway coming through. So it's very detrimental to the beauty of this small school that has been lovely and successful for a hundred years to make it into something else. It's making it into a whole other thing, making it into a very large modern building and underground garage I don't know whether ga the gates clang or bells ring uh, when the cars come in and out because we haven't been allowed to speak with the underground garage architects who are different than the building architects. Maybe so, we can ask that question real quick right now. Um, are, there, <laughs> are there bells and whistles? Are there noise and, and clangs, uh, Nancy, with the uh, garage? Jocelyn, I, I, I do not know the answer to the questions around what the sound of the, of the gate is. What I do, what I can tell you is it's very far set back from the sidewalk. Um, you know, one of the things that has been really important to us in our planning, and in fact, that first group that we worked with, noise was a very significant issue for them, which is why um, the new campus design moved cars below ground partly as a noise, it, 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 it was a noise issue, but more important, we moved the garbage pickups and all deliveries are moved into the center of campus as well as the pool is recessed with the pool. So we've been very conscious of noise. There's no backing up there. It's a single lane exit uh, and so that gives us, I think, probably a fair amount um, of control. But there's something that I want to say here uh, that, that I think is important. I think we can all agree that we have uh, neighbors with different points of views about the project, and I respect that. Um, I'm a neighbor, 
I'm out walking and I bump into all the neighbors and I've tried really hard to maintain, you know, positive relationships with the neighbors and, and really respect um, that different people have different opinions. We do have an EIR that was um, a study that was done for two and a half years. Uh, Bart Heckman, who I know was meant to, you know, you had hoped would join us tonight uh, during the PTC hearings said it was the most extensive EIR he had ever seen. And I, I believe that when we're in a situation like this, where we have neighbors agreeing to disagree, that it's incumbent upon the council who really, you know, it's, it's on their shoulders to make a decision, not just for today and not just for tomorrow, but what's going to be good for Palo Alto 25 years from now, 50 years from now. So, I mean, this is very complicated. And I think it's, it's important uh, that we rely on the resources that we have um, that have done the studies. And in fact, the Palo Alto Comprehensive Plan has um, calls for underground parking because it's environmentally superior because of the runoff of, um, from cars and uh, the, the rain on, you know, there's no rain on the cars, there's no water, there's no runoff. The, the surfaces don't have to be resurfaced as often. And um, the EIR called it the superior alternative. So, uh, you know, that, to me, um, that, that's, it's incumbent upon us to rely on that work. All right, thanks very much. Um, Janati. Yeah, we had a, quite a few reader questions about the garage, including why the garage is so important to the school and uh, why does increasing the enrollment of non-driving students require additional all-day parking spaces? And I hope we tackled some of those in, in the explanations we just heard, but I know it's an ongoing discussion and I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about that up this upcoming Monday. But um, I do wanna uh, pivot a little bit to the issue that just came up uh, about, uh, about the gross floor area. Um, we expected the council to make a decision um, this upcoming Monday about the Castellet proposal, or at least start to take some actions. Um, but last Thursday, um, staff released a memo basically recommending that the project be delayed, that then go back to the ARB because of a discrepancy that was detected in calculated square footage. Um, and uh, I won't get too deep in the details, but basically Castellet has said it's not going to increase square footage. It's gonna demolish and it's gonna rebuild without increasing. But it turns out that part of the building that is, de that is demolishing is a basement, which doesn't count in square footage but it wasn't factored in as a basement. And so as a result, the new building has to be slightly smaller by about 4,300 square feet. Mm -hmm. And either Nancy or Andy could correct me if I'm mischaracterizing anything. So um, I guess uh, I wanna give Castellet a chance to explain how this happened, first of all, because you guys have been working on this project for years. And uh, yeah, what happened there? Why the discrepancy? Yeah, um, you know, I, if, I wish I could pull up the document and, and share it with you. I don't have it handy. Uh, but um, so, so I, I'm not the one to really um, weigh in on who missed the handwriting. This was, you know, we, we submitted the documents with part of our application. So we weren't trying to hide anything. It was something that was misread and then was verified by others and misread. We have absolutely no issue with removing those square, the, that square footage from our plan. However, what we did do is um, I sent a letter to council today asking that they um, still, despite our needing to uh, potentially uh, going either having staff or a, a committee of ARB examine or approve those modifications, they really have everything that they need to go ahead and act on our, you know, all the elements of our application. And so we're really hoping uh, that, that they'll do that. But we're, we're, we're not going to dispute the, the square footage. Do you guys have any sense at this moment, and I know these findings just came up recently, but what elements of the project are to be scaled back um, to get this 4,300 square feet um, out of the project? So we just invited our architects to, you know, start, start to think about that. It will, uh, you know, it'll, be classroom, it'll be project space, it'll be wellness center, you know, it'll be something uh, that was was built 
into the into the project, but I, I, I couldn't even tell you now. Um, obviously, taking away those 4,000 square feet impacts us, I think in ways that the additional 4,000 square feet, I don't know how much they would have impacted the neighborhood, but we do want to abide by what we've said, which is we would like to retain the current square footage that we have. And, and I want to ask Andy, I know you know quite a bit about the subject. I know you guys have gone really deep into the square footage issue. Um, and you just heard, um, you know, Castellet would prefer for the council to kind of make his decision and send this to an A or B subcommittee so it doesn't delay the process too much longer. Do you think this 4,000 square foot issue um, is a big deal? Do you think, um, would you support that process or do you think this is a larger project problem that needs a kind of more substantive review? Exactly where I was going to go with it, Janati. Thank you. Because what we found with our deep dig into just public record, and you know, this was brought up in the draft EIR. We noticed that when the plans were originally submitted in 2016, that current existing square footage was here. And within a couple of years, current existing square footage was here. It had grown 16,500 square feet and we couldn't figure out what the heck was going on here. So in our deep dig, we found prior years like 1999, 2006, and then 2016, as I say, where it was all here. So we brought that up at the planning commission meeting. You know, I provided documents showing this is what the square footage, but here's what the school's saying. You gotta, you gotta square this and figure it out. For the, for the variance itself is based on what is existing square footage. Why was that number not measured? Um, I think at the planning commission, there was some indication that it was a measurement and it was a better measurement than the older measurements were. Um, so we went back again and started digging. And then we started just building the backup documents for each building to show what the square footage was. So not only was there found a basement of 7,000 that was included in a building that shouldn't have been, but there was another two basements that weren't included in this chart that um, both the school and the staff referred to as how they came to the number. And then there was another place where the number was um, less than. Um, so those were, I, we showed both ways. We showed the mistakes. And, and, and so then you've got a bigger picture. Oh my goodness. If that's the case, then we need, we need a number to be confirmed by a professional that um, can be supervised by, I don't know, the city manager or something, because this has been hanging around for months and months and months, and it hasn't been solved. What is the existing square footage. So it's not just this little 4,300 and you start putting this thing in a box and zero into this reduction as making the thing go away. There's still the issue of adding this garage square footage in there as well. So, um, and then you've got the issue of, you know, the situation with, we haven't even come to events yet, but it, it, you've got this misreading of the conditional use permit that, um, allowed the school to grow their events dramatically. And then you've got the enrollment issue, which- Events are, events are our next topic. <laughs> so, okay, all right, I'll stop yeah, about that. Actually, I think, let, let, let's, let's it's roll- It's a bigger it. issue, is well, what I'm saying. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Jocelyn introduce a special events topic and then we will let you get to-, uh, to yep. oh, um, well, 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 Janati, can I just say one thing about the measuring? Sure. Uh, it is my understanding that quite typically uh, what we rely on are um, prior per, prior documents from prior permits. I don't know that there's any project where um, you know that anybody goes out and remeasures. So I think if we have all the right documents that have all been approved by the city that have all of the right um, you know approvals, that tends to be um, the basis for the square footage. And um, and I, and I don't say this because. Um, you know, we're hoping to get away with more square footage. I say this because we're not looking for a yet another delay of our project. Well, thank you for that point. And um, mm -hmm. 
and he was gracious to transitionists for special events. Um, yes, she did that well. Excellent segue. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> special events, and then you, you'll both have a chance to talk about that in a moment. Right. So some background for everybody's um, knowledge. This current CUP allows for five major events a year and, quote, an undefined number of additional events with between 50 and 100 guests. Um, events are not that are not directly related to the Castilea School shall not be permitted after the year 2000, and traffic monitors are required at the events. Um, Andy, can you give us a sense of what special events feel like, look like, how they impact you uh, in the neighborhood? Yes, um, I'm happy to do that, thanks. What happened was we, you know, we became familiar with the uh, conditional use permit, when this application came out, we started looking at all the items on the conditional use permit because lo and behold, there were other things here that had not been uh, complied with. And my neighbors were saying, there is there are lights coming through at 10 o'clock at night through my living room window, my upstairs window. Um, I don't see these on the school's um, calendar of events. And then we realized that the the actual, the conditional use permit allows five major and several other, okay? So it's muddy language, but the school has taken several to mean 100. So in 2016, 17 and 17, 18, we all got together and uh, tracked events texted each other and tried to and built a spreadsheet basically and took it to who at that time was uh, the planning director was Hillary Geidelman and we said this is going on and on and it's just obviously um, non-compliance to the hill and what you know to to take it not to spend too much time on that is to say what we wanted to do and we took it to the current planning director and project um, manager on this point. Um, here's, you know, we want to just participate in determining what the what the events are. We would like input into that. And we're not too concerned about daytime events. So although we were at the planning commission sometimes derided as trying to keep people from having plan, you know, parent teacher or sports. No, that's not it. It's weeknights and weekends. And it should be respectful. And the school um, the city, I think, supplied some comparables of other private schools. We realized that this is a private school and it needs events, but it needs to learn how to, and the construction time might be a good time to learn how to do nighttime events and weekend events off site. Pally has 44 acres, you know, they can have all the events they want. Menlo School is a private school, but they've got 62 acres. So it's, it doesn't, uh, impact the neighborhood the way these do. So this has been a very contentious issue and we just want them brought down. We don't want them to go away entirely and certainly daytime events are not an issue. It's weeknights and weekends. And there've been, you know, you're not supposed to have events on Sundays, but, but there would be events on Sundays and it hasn't been adhered to. So this is a very important point that just, it doesn't have to be a big deal. It can just be limit the number of nighttime and weekend events, but there's probably, you know, 16 pages of this in the conditional use permit proposal. Yeah, it does sound like there are, um, there's a ban on events on Sundays and the number of events are limited to 74 with five major ones and um, 37 can be with 100 to 500 attendees. Um, Nancy nods if that's correct. <laughs> well, well I, I didn't realize, Jocelyn, if you were talking about our current CUP no. or the, our the proposed, the proposed. Um, so, so I'll just start off by saying that um, it, it was, I know the neighbors had many concerns about our events. I would agree that our CUP was not as clear as it could be, but we were deemed compliant at the time that neighbors went uh, to, to speak to Hillary. So there was, we were not found to be non-compliant. However, we did use that feedback to create um, what we thought would be good conditions for, for different events. And we did say, we didn't think we should have events on Sunday anymore, even though that was not part of, of 
of our um, earlier CUP. I think I want to just step back and, and you know, the term event is, a, is an interesting term because, um, as you know, we brought up earlier, we are not permitted to host any event for um, anyone other than, you know, school functions. None of our events, we don't have social events for families, for parents, really on our campus. We have a few dances per year. Most of the events that we're talking about are plays, robotics rehearsals, um, student performances, dance performances, uh, presentations of their projects. So, um, you know, as, as schools become more and more uh, central to the lives of children and families, it is true that um, there's, there's more family engagement and attendance at the school. So we recognize that this is something that, that we do need to pay attention to. We have reduced our events and we have proposed a further reduction of events. It will require us to have some events off campus. Um, that, that is absolutely, um, will, will end up being uh, a requirement for us. Um, Andy, I know that there's some requirements in the proposal that have to do with limiting noise. Um, are those restrictions that seem reasonable to you? Are there, or are there further restrictions that you think need to be in the um, CUP? I'm probably not hugely up to date on the noise issues. Um, we are more concerned with the pool that the school has chosen to move over and take underground 15 feet. But then when you add the deep end, that's, a that's 10 more feet. And so you're getting perilously close to the water table that I understand there are some noise abatement connections to that, but I think it should be weighed with um, environmental concerns. Follow-up question for Andy. Uh, I know that Castilea has proposed a 90 events. PTC, then the kind of the number went to 70. I think 74 is what the planning commission settled on and it's in the current draft conditions that the council will consider. Um, how do you feel about the number 74? Uh, it's less I feel great about the number 74, but what I, what I did was take the school's um, chart and just identified which ones are at night weeknights and weekends and pulled those out. And what we wanna do is limit those. So sure. to the extent, you know, uh, I think right now, I don't have it on the top of my head, but I think they've got 42 events at night and something like 27 on the weekends. And that's overdoing it. This is a nine month period. So that's a lot of events during nights and weekends. I will know the proposed CUP would have no events on Sundays and only five after 6 p.m. on Saturdays. Uh, the, the current event, the current CUP has improved. Uh, do you think that's sufficient to address those concerns? I'm sorry, I, I spoke over you. Say it again. Oh, no. I'm, I'm just curious if you think those conditions, um, no events on Sunday and limit to only five on Saturday after 6 p.m., if those conditions um, are enough to kind of uh, to answer your concerns about uh, that you just mentioned about special events. It, it doesn't cover it, uh, Janati. It's um, five on Saturday nights. It doesn't talk about the weekend, weekday weeknights or Saturdays. It can yeah. be a very busy place. It's so wonderful when they don't have an event on Sundays. Sometimes they do, but um, the quiet. Um, and, and we just, you know, it's, it's, it's a school. I understand that, but it's a very tiny school. It's a very tiny site in the middle of a bunch of houses and they just need to be respectful and follow their... So we're hoping that we can limit even more the night time weeknight and weekend events mm -hmm. and have some of those fundraisers, lots of, lots of activities. Mm -hmm. we, we don't have any fundraisers on campus. One thing I will say is it was our understanding, I'm so glad that I remembered to bring this up, that one of the issues of the noise of the events is car doors opening and closing, which uh, we would be using our underground parking for all of those um, evening and weekend events. 
And I know we have just a few more minutes left and we've been trying to sprinkle questions that we've been receiving from the audience throughout uh, this event, but uh, we do wanna save the last few minutes just to kind of specifically for audience questions that have come in um, both today mm -hmm. and last. And I think I, I wanna ask one that kind of cuts at the heart of the whole discussion we've been having for a few years. Given the school's past violations of its CUP, why should there be any credibility awarded to assurances of future adherence to a revised CUP? And maybe Nancy, we could start with you and uh, then go to Andy. I was wondering when we were gonna get to that question. I kind of anticipated it. Okay. So um, I don't know what more I can say other than you know I wish Curtis Williams and Sandy Sloan could be here um, and, and could vouch for the fact that uh, I came forward in, in 2012 to um, say that I wanted to correct this issue. We have reduced our enrollment. We've reduced our traffic. We've, um, we've had uh, a number of, you know, it's, it's interesting. There's a term that's come up, um, study sessions. And I didn't realize that was an official term, but I can remember many um, meetings in our um, dining room at the school with tables with um, various places that neighbors could come up and comment on plans and give suggestions about traffic flow. And we have done so much to regain the trust of so many of our neighbors. Mm -hmm. And I believe that that combined with the fact that we've structured our CUP such that we have to prove ourselves before we can continue to increase enrollment says a lot about, um, I mean, it basically, you know, Kathy and I may not be here, but the next uh, set of administrators will be bound by um, some limits that we've set for them. And I'll just add one more thing. The students who get to come to the school are the students who reap the benefits. Often I've heard something, why, you know, why should Castilea be rewarded? It's, it's, the, it's the 25 students a year from East Palo Alto, Palo Alto, Saratoga, Los Gatos, San Mateo, San Carlos, um, you know, all around our community on the peninsula who are want nothing more than an all girls option and they don't have it. Uh, those are the winners. If, um, if the community can agree to trust us. And, and, a, and a similar, thank you, Nancy. And, and a similar uh, question for Andy. Given the issue with the CUP in 2013 and before that that we discussed, what can Castileo do or what should Castileo do to regain the trust of those uh, who, who remain skeptical of its proposals and its promises? Yeah, I think what we've seen is uh, a pattern of disregard for uh, the city of Palo Alto's use permit requirements. So it's not that we, it's not that the school made an error in 2013 and came clean. They are still over enrolled. I think it's important to note that it's been a battle all the way to try to get them to comply and as to the events, they in fact did get a notice from the planning director Geidelman saying, it, you aren't operating within the spirit of what the thing says. The language may be muddied, but you know, it was, you were meant to limit events. So then you come up to the square footage, you know, for almost five years, the variance that the school is asking for, uh, is based on the current existing square footage. And now we know we can't rely on that. So just to take one piece of that and to try to make that tunnel into uh, heading towards an approval, I don't wanna drag this thing out either. I think it should just be very clearly figure out what the square footage is and then limit enrollment until the proofs can come out that direction. I'll stop there. All right. Um, it is almost the bewitching hour of 8.30. And I just want to have two final questions, one for each of you. And um, we'll start with Andy. Um, in your perfect world, would your preference be for Castilea 
to stay where it is and to have the 450 students? Or do you have another preference, uh, maybe that Castellet would move to another property altogether? Um, what, what is your ideal vision for Castellet with respect to your neighborhood? Thank you, that's a great question. I would love for the school to um, rebuild, modernize their school, and stay at around 450 and keep it the small bucolic school that has been successful for 100 years and can be successful for 100 more. You know, take away the underground garage and bring down the scope of this plan. And it would be so cool to be able to then support this project and all of us neighbors could enjoy it. Thank you so much. Um, and Nancy, in your perfect world, what happens on Monday night when the council deliberates? Oh, thank, thank you for asking me that. And, and thank you, Jocelyn and Janati and Andy. I really um, appreciated this opportunity tonight. Um, in my ideal world on Monday night, the council recognizes that we have reduced the scope of our plan, that uh, the council recognizes that we have regained the trust of many, though not all, of our neighbors and that they uh, understand the importance of us maintaining our current square footage. And they appreciate that neighbors, there are many neighbors who would like to see cars off the street, not on the street or, or um, on the surface. So um, I hope that, I would hope that the council would recognize that. And I would hope that Five years from now, um, we'll be, you know, we'll be talking about um, how, you know, the people of Palo Alto who all care so deeply, and that's what this is all about. I mean, Andy cares about the neighborhood. I care about the neighborhood. Uh, all of us care about Castellia School. Of course, we're not all going to agree on everything, but my, in my uh, dream world, when the project is finished, we'll all be able to agree um, that it was worth all this effort. All right, thank you. This has been a really long journey for all of you. I know you're looking forward to what happens uh, Monday and, and if not on Monday, then um, in the coming months. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for explaining yourselves. We really appreciate this uh, more open forum in order to kind of surface some of the issues and the reasons behind them. Um, thank you, Andy Reid. Thank you, Nancy Kaufman. Thank you, Kathy Leyendecker. Uh, for also being here. Um, thank you to all who are attending. If there's any part of this that you missed or you want to share this video with others, you can find it on our YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash PA Weekly. So on behalf of the Palo Alto Weekly and Palo Alto Online, um, thanks for being here. Really appreciate it and have a good night. Thank you.